you're only as good as your last game. Okay. And I just played the kickoff tournament for Roy Hobbs down in Florida. And I played on a 45 and over team, and I'm 67. I pitched six innings in the championship game, went three for four, hit a one-out double past the first baseman into the right field corner, and scored the winning run with two outs. So at 67, you're only as good as your last game, okay, and, well, I, there you go. and I'm All great. Right. A controversial southpaw who pitched for the Boston Red Sox from 69 to 78 and the Expos from 79 to 82, Bill Spaceman Lee is almost as famous for his off-field antics as his success on the pitcher's mound. The co-author of four books and the co-owner of his own California red wine, Spaceman Red, Lee still pitches in tournaments around the world. We caught up with the larger-than-life character at his home in Vermont. Bill, I want to talk to you a little bit about your lineage because uh, there, there, your family is, has a history of baseball. There were some amazing ball players in your family before you came along, right? I mean, oh, my aunt was a lot better than me. I'm, uh, she's, uh, I'm living proof that talent skips a generation. <laughs> She was that good. She threw a perfect game, and they wrote a poem about her to the cadence of uh, Edgar Allan Poe's uh, Annabelle Lee in The Sepulchre by the Sea, and her curveball was unbelievable, unhittable. And then she threw a no-hitter overhand, and her father played for the Hollywood Stars in California and taught Bobby Doerr how to play second base. So I come from a family of ball players. My father played. He wasn't good enough uh, because he came out after World War II and uh, everybody flooded the market then. But he threw hard, yeah. and he was a little short, pugilistic Irishman. And he had two sons. He had a giant son, me, and he had the little short well, I was going to say, you just said he was a little short guy. So what? I had my mother's genes. Okay. My mother was 5'11". She was uh, Barbara Stanwyck, the Big Valley. She was gorgeous. She owned a lot of property. And my father really married up. Okay. <laughs> so were you encouraged to play ball when you were little? I played all the time with my aunt. Yeah. My father had built the uh, the conduit and the underground uh, telephone between L.A. and San Francisco, and he was gone a lot. And my aunt raised me, and then my father would come home, and I played and uh, would go to his games. He played for Scotty Drysdale, Don Drysdale's dad. Okay. Played for Jackson Paint, and I would uh, go out and catch frogs and chase rabbits down while he was playing ball. And then we'd go to Foster's Freeze. I remember this. And he'd give me a root beer shake, and I'd get all jittery and sugared out of my brain, and then I'd run around again until I fall asleep. So I was, <laughs> okay, that sounds like a good that, childhood. That's <laughs> I'm a poster child for ADD <laughs> okay. and uh, not to give sugar to children. Okay, yeah, the, uh, yeah really. Um, when when did you decide that it was pitching? Ah, uh, my eyesight kind of went, and I was a great hitter in high school and then I was predominantly only a pitcher in college because uh, it changed. I went to USC, a big school, but I did hit about 330 as a freshman and I hit a few home runs and I hit for the cycle against Oregon State when I met my wife, Miss Alaska, in 1968 in my senior year. I've had some good years hitting and now I've had that radial keratotomy on my left eye okay. and now I can see I can see the tin roof four miles away yeah. down there, and I. It's a little late in the day now, isn't it? But no, I, I. You're only as good as your last game. Okay. And I just played the kickoff tournament for Roy Hobbs down in Florida, and I played on a 45 and over team, and I'm 67. I pitched six innings in the championship game, went three for four, hit a one out double past the first baseman into the right field corner, and scored the winning run with two outs. So at 67, you're only as good as your last game, okay, and, well, I, there you go. and I'm All great. Right. Why is it that I get the feeling from everything I've read about you and the, and the books that you've written and, and all the interviews that you've given that it's almost like you can remember every damn pitch you've ever thrown? You can't. Dr. Penfield said that from the University of Montreal. They got a street named after him right, right there. Yes, and uh, they said if you put a synapse in there or you smoke the right type of cannabis sativa, you can re actually relate to all those thoughts at that synapse. They'll come together and you can bring up everything that you did in every moment of your life. And I have that ability. And it drives general managers crazy. I'm sure it does. <laughs> it would drive anybody crazy. Does it drive you crazy sometimes? It, it does. Like we're doing this interview and it's dead quiet up here, isn't it? Yes, Except for the tinnitus in my ears, which is uh -huh. louder than the volume of our conversation. 
Okay. So I'm surrounded by the guns of Navarone <laughs> my, whole, my whole life, and it really... But I get over it because I know that after we do this interview, we'll have a nice meal and we'll get to drink. How, so, <laughs> how long have you had the tinnitus? Uh, 47. I remember the day yeah. I got it. At 47 years of age, I woke up to this roar, and it never has gone away. But the funny thing is I can elevate it or regulate it with caffeine and nicotine okay. and by cardiovascular and by snowshoeing. Like from here, you saw how we got up my driveway. I snowshoe. Everywhere I go, I right. snowshoe to get the mail. I snowshoe to get my car out of the garage. Over at Denton's, I'll snowshoe down along the Black River and scare the hell out of all the day glow cross-country skiers. And I'll, I'll cross-country ski up to the, to the gym and play basketball on Wednesday nights. And, uh, and all that exercise affects the tinnitus. You can lower it? I can lower okay. it by raising your cardiovascular okay. risk right now. Okay. And it, but it's my mother had it, and she had it for the last 40 years of her life, and she lived to be 86. Yeah. My dad lived to be 88. Hazel lived to be 99. Uh, Rockwell Dennis Hunt on my mother's side lived to be 99. So I'm going to fall in that category. And so okay. I can put up with it. I just drink more. I got, I got it. Okay. All right. God. Wow. <laughs> I, need, I need, you got to write me that prescription. Um, it's easy. So I got, um, one of the things, that I want to ask you about this, because you, know, you and I are almost exactly the same age, and I know that my, my perception growing up was that back in the 60s, um, if you were one of those people who knew exactly what it is that you wanted to do with your life and just went at it straight on, you tended, in my experience, you tended to lean a certain way politically. And if you're one of those other people who didn't know what you wanted to do until you were, say, around 30, like me, you tended to lean in a another direction, which would be sort of left. You seem to be the exception that proves the rule because you knew what you wanted to do, but you went, some would say, way left. I'm so far left, I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> if you took uh, Ho Chi Minh and, uh, Eddie F and Rush Limbaugh okay. and put them back to back on the planet Earth, they'd be standing next to one another. So that's how I look at things. It's a round object, and it, it's, it's all a bunch of lunacy, and, uh, you know, around and around and around and around. And uh, it's the spaceman. Yeah. It's Harry Nielsen. And I live everything by what ne Harry Nielsen or Mel Brooks said. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. those are, those that's are, the, pretty good. Those are my two godfathers, right. along okay. with Buckminster Fuller, okay. uh, Paramahasa Yogananda, you know, uh, George Ivanovich Gurdjieff, who was the whirling dervish who taught Frank Lloyd Wright, who was the architect, and then uh, Buckminster Fuller with the geodesic dome. And you go back, and it just keeps going around and around. So I am neither left nor right. I can juggle. I can switch hit. I golf right-handed. I play. Uh, I hit left-handed. I throw left-handed. But I'm pretty ambidextrous with my feet. I can play soccer very well. And I just adhere to a corpus callusium of my two hemispheres of my brain, which allow me to do everything. And therefore, I'm not left or right, but uh, I do tend to believe that Republicans have short arms, tight fists, and they can never get to the bottom of their pockets. So that's why I'm a Canadian at heart, because <laughs> you guys take care of one another. You're much nicer people. You have all the fresh water, you have all the yellow cake, and you have all the tar sands. So why do you need America? Okay, now I'm going to ask you this, and I don't want you to be offended when I ask you this, but uh, <coughs> at what point did you realize that you were a mouthy bugger? A what? A mouthy bugger. When did you start shooting your mouth off and, and, uh, and alienating oh, I people just, or pissing people off? It, toler it, just, it upsets me when I hear lies. When I hear lies, I just can't tolerate... Uh, you know, uh, Rush Limbaugh was one, and uh, trying to think of some other guy, that uh, the one from Seaholm High School that my son went to school with, Beck. Oh, yeah, Glenn Beck, yes. Okay. Beck went to school with my son, and I was a coach at their school. If I had known that, I'd drilled him in the head a long time ago, and we wouldn't have him to think about right now. <laughs> you know, and I could say, officer, it just got away from me, you know. And as a pitcher, you can actually do homicide you know, and uh, get away with it, and the world would be a better place. No, I, 
I mean, you, know, so you just—it seems like you just can't control yourself. Is there something like you know calling Zimmer a gerbil? All those, all those things that have—I know, I, past, you know, just like, and most people would would some sensor in their mind would say, "Don't do that. It's not going to be worth it." Then you I just know. go ahead and do it. I do it. It's bad, bad habit. But but I don't think you regret <laughs> any of it. I get the impression you don't regret any of it. No, because usually history will prove me right. If I go along long enough, it'll prove me right. I have said some things that I wish I hadn't said, and uh, but I haven't done time. <laughs> so I've looked at it that way, I, officer and stuff. The other day I got pulled over on my, 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 what do you call it, uh, the serpentine belt broke and everything else, and I was just driving home, and we were all loaded. I'd had three beers, and I had a chicken in the car. And, like uh, you do. Like I do, and I said, honey, I got my flashers on. It's starting to snow. I'm pretty sure a statey's going to come up here, and I won't eat that chicken. You're not eating that chicken? I said, no, nope, honest. i got to eat that chicken. I'd rather smell a chicken than beer. And sure enough, trooper pulls up about five minutes later, and out gets the first black Vermont State trooper I've ever seen. And I'm eating chicken, and I went, go figure. <laughs> <laughs> and I threw it away like that. He goes, sir, is everything all right? I said, perfect. I said, I've just eaten, and uh, I'm waiting for my wrecker. You got a wrecker coming? Yes, yes, sir. He goes, have a nice day. And I look at my <laughs> wife, and I'm saying, that's why you don't mess with the big dog. <laughs> yeah, that was, so that's, that was my day yesterday. So it's, that's how my life. I live my life serendipitously. I have no watch. I have no rings. I have no clocks. I have no cell phone. I have no computer, and I just walk like Mr. Magoo, one foot at a time. Now, you, you seem to be still kind of peripatetic. You're still, like you're only in this place, you told me earlier, three months out of the year. As little as possible. There was a time, there was a time <laughs> when you were playing all over the place. It seemed to me, it, it, I got the impression, you were, it was like you were on the road all the time playing for, you were in Venezuela, you were in New Brunswick, you were, you know, you were all over the place. Cuba. Yeah. I'm only happy when I'm on the road. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I am. Oh, I'm. I'm. I'm in, I can like it here for a little bit, but then I have. It's like my feet are on fire, you know. I'm a real live wire. It's like a, a burn song, you know. Psycho killer, qu'est-ce que c'est? <laughs> and it's that's the way I've. I'm always been that way. I've always wanted to know what's over the next ridge. And all my ex-wives know it's a Walmart. <laughs> but I don't believe that. I believe that. As you go north, there's less and less. So I, I tend to go north because I like the sun at my back, and that's why I've always loved the north. It's uh, I hate going south. You, you spent you spent a lot of time in Canada, an awful lot of time in Canada. I and I was I, I remember reading uh, it was I think it was Have Global Travel. You're talking about playing in in uh, in Moncton, living in Moncton actually. I did four because years. I think you I think you referred to it Moncton as a as a very good uh, drinking town that has a fishing problem. Yeah, <laughs> I'm the only guy that ever went to Moncton to dry out. <laughs> That's how dumb I am. <laughs> First time I get there, there's a Chris Rock, and we're sitting under the portrait of uh, Babe Ruth. It's called the Liar's Table. And I'm going, wow, I'm my home. You know? <laughs> and I just love their beer. I love the Moosehead uh, Red. I, I'm not the big green lager drinker. I'm an ale drinker. And Moosehead uh, Ale just seemed to agree with my constitution. And I just kept drinking it. And it was fabulous. It was it was like molson export, which seemed to agree to my constitution and my uh, mitochondria, which are surrounding every cell in your body. They just party on, and I think that we're only living just to support the bacteria in our system. We're a host. People, they think we're actually alive. We're not alive. We're just supporting a bar, a bar scene that's living in our body. It's from uh, the centriolas and the mitochondria in our system. And the, the further north you go with the light on your back, it's good to have the heat on your back, not in your face. You know, like officer, you always got a light there and stuff like that. The lights are always, when you head to Canada, it's always on your back. And the view is always impressive. And then eventually you get up there and it gets real dark. And then they have all these little sled dogs that go around and they... <laughs> They start walking around. You know what I want you to tell? I want you to tell me about Lumsden, Saskatchewan. You wrote about going there. Oh. I just thought that was a, 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 a guy named little... Beast. I remember that. Beast. His name was Beast. He ran an insurance company. And I went back there to try and find him and to 
see if this really did happen because it's been so long ago I, I, I speak about it but I go to Lunston I can't find him I can can't find the ball field but he had duck races I remember that he used to put ducks out there and then they'd right. go and you'd bet on the number of the ducks. Little plastic ducks no plastic yeah. ducks so I go there and I remember it was a drought year the puddles had all dried up like in California the baby geese were getting ready to die they just hatched they had no water and I went out and I, I remember I'm playing for the Cubs and I hit a home run late in the ball game to win the ball game and as soon as the ball cleared the fence the sky opened up and it rained for four days straight days and I saved the wheat crop and all these baby geese and you had told them you said yeah. you had told them in, in, in advance yes that you had a sense that it was going to rain because ball players will get that sense I saw I saw it coming and I knew that I hit the home run. it was just like the natural when I hit that home run it just crackled just like that like Robert Redford and uh, it was probably the greatest home run I ever hit see now that was that's what I want to ask you about because I thought one of the most telling things was you saying at the end of that chapter where you described the story you said running the bases after you'd hit that, feeling like Roy Hobbs in the natural. And you said, there it is right there. You can't not be romantic about baseball. This is why we do it. This is why we do it. It's the greatest feeling. When I hit that double pass there, this was a left-hander. He's throwing, and the right-handers couldn't hit him. And me and our first baseman, uh, we were the only two left-handers in the lineup, and we hit him pretty good. And I remember, and I took ball one, I took ball two, I took a strike, and then two and one, he hung a breaking ball, and I just laced it. And when you hit a ball on the button with a wood bat that you have just made, there's no better feeling in the world. It's the most amazing thing, and that's why you... It is like it. Wonder Boy, right? It is. I, I make Wonder Boy. I'm, I have tons of bats. I, I can't get rid of them. That's why I'm the world's worst salesman. I make wine, and I drink all my own wine, and I, and I, I, I garnish and save all my old bats. I'm, that's, that's the opposite of being a socialist. I am so clingy to my own things that I make that I have trouble getting them, giving them away. You've said that you're, uh, when you're talking about the, the kind of pitcher you are, you have said that, because you don't have a fastball, right? You're, you're a I pitcher do now. of deception. As, as I've gotten, at 67, I throw yeah. hard. Okay. That's an amazing thing. I've turned into Nolan Ryan, a, le a left-handed Nolan Ryan. I can bury the ball on a 65-year-old now. I can just throw it into his kitchen. There's nothing he can do about it. And it's like, wow, I feel like Bob Feller. That's the great thing about staying in shape and being a logger and out there with the skitters and making my own sawmill and doing everything. I stay strong where all my opponents get weaker every day. And But I am still a... A shit baller, as they say. I, okay. I, can, I can throw the ball off the plate. I have the overhand curve. Larry Coglin, who s fixed my shoulder, and, you know, the best guy up there. He lives in my ex-wife's house on 305 Pine Tree Crescent. You know, and I'm trying to get him up there to fix my wife's wrist. She fell down, not these stairs, but another friend of mine's stairs on Thanksgiving. I tell you, we just can't drink like we used to. <laughs> And yet we persist. But we persist. But the funny thing is, when you fall when you're drunk, you usually don't get hurt too bad. Yeah. You know, one of the things that you... Uh, explain this to me, too. I didn't know until I was reading your books that, about the idea that ballparks, architects design ballparks to face west most of the time. Yes. So you were talking about when you were playing in Venezuela and it was how hot it was and you couldn't... And, and as a left-hander, you're... you're oh, Barquisi Mato. Yeah. There's no air. If there's no air, there's no way the bottle could break. It was like it was suffocating. So every pitch you were throwing was coming in flat across the plate. Flat. The closer I get to the equator, the less break I have on the ball. <laughs> or the number of vowels in the hitter's name dictate how bad it is. Oliva, can't get him out. You know, <laughs> Cepeda, couldn't get him out. <laughs> Anybody that ends Tell me up, you don't really think like that. Because that gets into your head and then you're doomed. Hey. At 61, I pitched in Alaska against UCLA freshmen and beat them, and my ball was moving up in Alaska. I've got a feeling the further north you go, the westerlies blow at you. Therefore, you're throwing, because I'm a southpaw and the west is over here, my ball sinks more. And as I get to the equator, there's more trade winds. Therefore, my ball doesn't sink as well. I've got a feeling it, it's all geography and Coriolis effect. Because I know, I, when I go to Latin, I haven't won in Cuba in five years. They just knock, the, they, they knock me stiff. So wow. I've got a feeling the further north I go, the better I play. Wow. Uh, 
uh, let's talk about the other aspects of your life because you've been involved in a whole bunch of things. Well, let's talk about you running for president for the Rhinoceros Party because you met with Charlie McKenzie, Charlie. a guy that I used to interview quite regularly back in the 80s when I was working in radio. You did. I did, yes. What a he, great guy. He approached you to run for, he approached you in Montreal. Montreal. To run for president of the United States. Yes, in a bar over on uh, Duluth. On Duluth. Wow, you do know. He gave me, they brought me a link from the Geodesic Dome, Buckminster Fuller, and they brought me a six-pack of uh, Molson Export. And I said, sure, I'll do it. <laughs> I said, so I was going to build my house out of that geodesic link, but I couldn't get anybody up here to build me a geodesic dome on a flat, round area. I was gonna, This was going to be a dome. And then uh, Lyle Raymond, who was, uh, he built, Watson's house from IBM over here in Burlington, okay. the guy who invented IBM, and then this house, and then that house, and then my house. This is the last house bought, bought, built by Lyle Raymond. Okay. So it's solid. It's a stick house, and I put every 2x6, every 2x8, every 2x12 rafter. I built this house from scratch, so I, I've got that. Going. Have you still got the piece of the dome somewhere? Because they did this to It's you, right here. It? It's under it the is. snow. Okay. I right. could dig it out. It's right, right okay. over by my okay. well. All right. My so well now tell house. me a little bit more about this campaign. Because first of all, they, they decided that Hunter, you decided that Hunter S. Thompson should be your running mate, right. vice president. Because he knows more about vice than anybody in America. But 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 nobody, you couldn't get a hold of him. I couldn't. Kimball, George Kimball, the one eyed writer for the Herald, he, he and Hunter went back a long way. And I had a lot of other people that we had mutual friends. But we never could hook up because he was busy, and I'm flighty. I'm all over the place. And McKinsey didn't have any money, and this <laughs> other. So basically, it was a bunch of ex-cons and and Vietnam draft dodgers, and uh, we all got in a van and drove down to see Abby Hoffman in New Hope, Pennsylvania. And then he anointed me and said, "Yeah, run." So what did I do? I go to the penitentiaries and I tried to solicit the vote of all these cons that are not allowed to vote. And then Bill, good I said, move. It's a good move. I said, man, there's no way I'm going to get elected. I said, I knew if I did get elected, I'd be shot within the first week of my presidency because, you know, that had been the end of capitalism <laughs> as we know it. And you still, didn't you still put Thompson's name as in absentia? Yeah, yeah, Vice yeah. presidential candidate in absentia. I, I had to. Did he ever find out? You no, know? I don't think he found out. He would have shot me too. He was a yes, right Yes, he would have shot you. Yes, he would have. He carried, he was a gun toter and stuff. Well, I've got guns. I mean, if you when you walked in, you went by a 12 gauge Auto Five. I have uh, two 22s with a serpentine clip, but it's single shot, so it's not a repeater. And I use that to trim my maple trees for the Southern View. That's unique. It's unique. I'm yes. the only guy. What do that, your neighbors think of that? It's a, it's uh, a way Lee's, of sighting. Lee's, Lee's out trimming the trees. Again. I'm trimming <laughs> the trees, so I shoot to the south and I trim the trees. I know where the where the bullets are going to land, so I make sure I don't hit anybody. Goes way over Moffat's tree farm, so I'm, I'm at least good there. And and then when I put in my cable upstairs, I remember I took the thirty odd six and just blew a hole right through the uh, outside underneath the floorboards and stuff, so I could run my cable in from that side of the house. You mean instead of using a drill, <laughs> I use a gun. <laughs> okay, it worked. Well, a lot see now this is very Hunter Thompson esque. I got to tell you. Well, it there is. There's a whole hell of a lot of difference between the two. Except you're alive and he's dead. I know. And the, it is. New, New Year's Eve, I usually go off and fire a few rounds off the front porch, and uh, that uh -huh. wakes up the neighbors. And <laughs> the neighbors that you get along with so well. Well, she's never there. She's actually in Ontario. Uh, she's a girl from Ontario, never been married, and she's 64 years old, and she lives with her sister and psychiatrist husband in Palm Springs in the winter, so okay. I never see her. So you firing off weapons. I'm firing off weapons. I could shoot right through that house all day long, never hit anything. <laughs> and she's got a, a lamp with a red la lamp bulb, and it looks like a whorehouse down there at night anyway <laughs> when it comes up. <laughs> so, so, yeah, and you can shoot in that direction. That's Canada, so that ain't going to hurt yeah, anybody. <laughs> there's nobody there. That's right. So I do, I do have a lot of guns. Okay, I, uh, I, now, so as long as we're talking about these sorts of things, let's go from, from guns to drugs. Yeah. Okay. That's so, a good so one. you got uh, you got saddled really early because of again shooting your mouth off. Well, I was I protested a lot and uh, I ended up hanging out with Carbo and Willoughby and Wise and everybody and we smoked a lot back in the days and then I get traded and then they said we had a drug problem on the Red Sox. I said most definitely they've been abusing nicotine, caffeine, caffeine and alcohol way too long and they got to put a stop to it. 
no, no, Bill, we mean marijuana. I said, I've been using that since 1964. Headlines, Lee smokes dope. And I remember that. I see it all along, and Bowie Kuhn brings me in, and Art Fuss, the drug czar, and they sit me down, and I have no representation. And they go, you said that. I said, no, I didn't. It says, well, right there, you said it. I said, no, I didn't. I said, that's the headline writer. That's not the guy that wrote the article. Bowie goes, you're kidding me. I said, you want to buy a bridge? And then they read it, and then they get down, and they go, did, did, Bowie, did I say that I smoked pot in there anywhere? He says, no, you used it. The lawyer says, how do you use it? I said, well, every morning I get up and I, I run six miles along Daytona Beach and I have an ounce of marijuana on my buckwheat pancakes and Vermont syrup. It makes me impervious to the bus fumes. He goes, so you use it as a condiment. <laughs> I went, yeah, Bowie, I use it as a condiment. Well, let me talk. We're going to have to fine you for that. And they go, 250 bucks. And he says, you can send me a check. I said, no. You're not going to send me a check? I said, no, it'll end up in a Nixon re-election campaign fund. How do I know it's not? <laughs> and then finally, I sent the money to St. Mary's, Alaska, to a mission up on Circle on the frickin' 90 degrees north longitude. And uh, I said, I'll keep them in moose meat. So that's how the drugs come, and now I'm on the cover of High Times. And then I'm on the cover of High Times, and... I'm the only guy that's been on the cover of High Times three times, and I don't even smoke anymore. <laughs> but just, I do eat brownies. On, it takes, <laughs> but it does take on a life of its own, does it? I mean, it, it does. gets out of control, and then it's out of control. People worship me and throw stuff. My first win in Montreal, I beat uh, I beat the Chicago Cubs two to one. I get a base hit. I beat Krukot. I remember this. And the fans I had the long beard, and they started throwing stuff at me. And I come off the field, and I've got tons of tin foil. I'm picking it up. I'm putting it in my hat. I come in and I, I do my interviews. I open it up. I got 22 grams of hash. I'm going, welcome to the big leagues. Welcome <laughs> to Montreal. As it was, I won 16 games, but I don't remember the last 15. <laughs> but I could, I could flat out pitch. And everybody says, well, that Lee, he's got a drug problem. And my theory is find out what he's smoking and give it to the rest of the staff. <laughs> But what I thought was interesting, when you wrote about being in Venezuela, and this is where this kind of thing gets out of control, oh, yeah. you got approached by a guy in Venezuela trying to sell you cocaine, Oh, right? God, a whole bunch. And this looked like a setup. Well, he, I knew the guy. I knew Gustavo. Gustavo used to live in my basement up in Montreal when I had the house over on Grosvenor, and it was his partner that had an import-export business, and they were trying to have me bring some back directly when I left Venezuela. And I said, why do you need me? It's already in Montreal. It's like taking coal to Newcastle. You know? I said, if you can't get drugs in Montreal, you're not trying. And so I go, and I knew. I mean, I'm just, I may be stupid, but I'm not stupid. You know, and I don't want to deal. I don't want to be a mule or anything like that. And, uh, I mean, life is, you just, you can do what you want. But don't do it to the point where it's going to bring you down as a, uh, how would you say it, a dependency mm -hmm. like that. I mean, I still drink. I drank a whole bottle of tequila here the other day and then watched the, uh, the Olympics and stuff and watched the hockey game because you had to get up early to watch Canada. Here I am with Team Canada and my wife and Team USA is fighting Finland for the bronze and they don't even show up. And there I am and uh, she's calling everybody and I'm calling my friends and Hey, Team Canada, the girls, the men, they're freaking, they were awesome. They were. They were. We run short of time, Bill. I'm sorry about that. That's all right. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about that. <laughs>